today, today's a significant day. It's Mother's Day. And today's another day, uh, anniversary for, for me, for my family. Uh, today is my nephew's 30th birthday. Um, he would have been 30 years old today, but about a month after he turned 11, he died in a car crash along with his father. And so this week I've been praying for my sister-in-law, thinking about how Mother's Day for her coincides with a difficult day. And I recognize that for many people here today, maybe today's just a sad day. Maybe today has a lot of mixed emotions. Maybe there's joy in, in your children or your mother, but maybe there's some sadness in, in other relationships and other things that are going on. And so I want to acknowledge this morning that, that today can be a difficult day. But we want to look this morning in God's word in 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I've preached on Mother's Day from this passage before, but I'm going to preach a, a, a new message today because we're just going to kind of start here and we're going to shape and talk about the message today in the context of motherhood, of parents and children, but we're going to look at some principles that have a lot of application to all of our relationships to challenges that we face, things that we encounter. And so we want to look at this story this morning. One of my favorite stories in all of Scripture, in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and beginning in verse 1. It says, There was a man named Elkanah who lived in Ramah in the region of Zuf, in the hill country of Ephraim. So now you guys know where we're talking about, right? I don't know either, but there was hills, okay? He went, he was the son of Jeroh Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuth of Ephraim. Elkanah had two wives, Hannah and Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah did not. So there's a guy, he's got two wives. Hannah, his wife, has no children. The other wife, Peninnah, and that's probably, let's call her Pam. Um, she, had, she had kids. Each year, Elkanah would, tra Elkanah would travel to Shiloh to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of heaven's armies at the tabernacle. So this is a time when the, the Hebrew people there, there's not been a king anointed. Uh, there's not, Jerusalem is not their capital. There's no temple. It's before all of that. They've come out of slavery and they're in the promised land, but they worship at the tabernacle, which was a tent. And so Elkanah, this man, was a devout believer of Jehovah God. And yearly he would make this trip to the tabernacle, and they would offer sacrifices. They would worship. And he would come with his two wives and his children. On the days Elkanah, verse 4, presented his sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to Peninnah or Pam and each of her children. And though he loved Hannah, he would give her only one choice portion because the Lord had given her no children. So Peninnah would taunt Hannah and make fun of her because the Lord had kept her from having children. Year after year, it was the same. Peninnah would taunt Hannah as they went to the tabernacle. Each time, Hannah would be reduced to tears and would not even eat. And so we see this dynamic within this family that's taking place. Verse 8, why are you crying, Hannah? Elkanah would ask. Why aren't you eating? Why be downhearted just because you have no children? You have me. Isn't that better than having 10 sons? I love that verse. <laughs> because I'm thinking, oh, Elkanah, bro, you have two wives, you should know better. Right? Couple of mistakes here. This isn't even part of the message. Just let's like free from a guy who's been married for 30 years. 
Don't, in, don't try to fix a problem you can't fix, right? Mistake number one. Then mistake number two, it's not that bad. You got me. In my experience, you got me hasn't ever fixed anything. I'm just saying. Like my wife had a stroke one time and she had a hole in her heart. And I was like, baby, I thought I filled that hole. And she was like, I'm having surgery now. Like, that's true. That happened. You got me. That's not enough. But I love that verse because you see the reality of what's taking place, right? You see what's going on. And Elkanah's like, oh, I think I can fix this. I can make you feel better. And I'm like, oh, you can't. And he didn't. Once, after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made this vow, O Lord of heaven's armies, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime as a sign that he has been dedicated to the Lord. His hair will never be cut. And as she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. Seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought she had been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. Now this is interesting too, isn't it? That I was thinking about this. I was like, was it common that people would come in drunk that Eli would jump to this conclusion? Or does it say something about Eli that when seeing someone in, in such deep prayer, his thought was, she must be drunk? Either way, doesn't really speak well about the situation, amen? Amen. But Hannah says, no, sir, I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged, and I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of great anguish and sorrow. She was praying, and her lips were moving, but no sound was coming out, and Eli thought, we got another one. But Hannah said, no. I'm just so burdened. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked him of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. The entire family got up early the next morning, went to worship the Lord once more, and then they returned home to Ramah. When Elkanah slept with Hannah, the Lord remembered her plea, and in due time she gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I asked the Lord for him. And so I want to use this story as kind of a jumping off place this morning. We're not going to go through point by point of this story, but we want to take some principles that I believe are found here and are found in God's word. The first thing in this, whether you're raising kids, whether you're uh, involved in other relationships and in, in every area of our life, godliness is to be priority one. Godliness needs to be the first priority. Hannah was in deep anguish, 1 Samuel 1.10 says, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow to the Lord. She said, listen, God, I want to serve you. I, and, and she was going to God for her problems. Certainly in raising children, godliness needs to be our priority. Psalm 127 and verse 1 says, unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Think about that for a moment. Unless God builds the house, the work is wasted. That means your children can get great educations. Your children can have success in their careers. Your children can be, you know, great athletes or scholars or musicians or whatever, but if they don't have God, that work is wasted. And I was thinking about that, just reflecting on my family, my children. 
And I don't, I talk about my kids a lot, often in humorous or illustrative ways. They love that. I don't try to hold my children up as examples because as pastor's kids, they get looked at enough. And my wife and I are far from perfect parents and we raised far from perfect children. But I will say this, the things that I love about my children the most relate to their relationship with God. See, I love that my, that my children are honest. I appreciate that they're hardworking. But they do that not just because dad instilled those character things in them, but because they love Jesus Christ and they have a relationship with him and that forms the way that they live their life and the character that they have. They are not perfect. Let me be clear. But we are extremely blessed as parents. And honestly, all I want for my kids is for them to love Jesus. Because then they'll be good husbands and wives. Then that'll affect and they'll be good employees or employers. Then they'll be good parents someday. All of those things are are formed out of their relationship with Christ. And so godliness has got to be the priority. Scripture is our standard. Let me be clear. Scripture is our standard. Not tradition, not our wisdom. We need to go to God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning of verse 14 says, but Paul, writing to Timothy, his protege in the ministry, he says this, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. You know they are true, for you know you can trust those who taught you. You have been taught the Holy Scriptures from childhood, and they have given you the wisdom to receive the salvation that comes by trusting in Christ Jesus. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Listen, I don't care whether it's a Christian author or a secular author. The standard for raising our children should not be what some author puts in a book. It's, it's scripture. You might say, well, I had godly parents and I was raised this way, so I'm gonna raise my kids that way. That, that's not a bad idea. And certainly most of us end up saying things at, that our parents said to us, whether we want to or not. But that's not the standard. The standard is God's word. The standard for all of our life needs to be based and foundationed on Scripture. And if it's not, then it's not going to be as solid as we want it to be. Scripture is the standard, and the Holy Spirit is our guide. Again, who influences you? Think about, have you thought about that? Who influences you? Who, who, do, who when you start to talk about something, do you sound like someone else? Jesus said this to his followers in John chapter 16. There's so much more I want to tell you. He'd been talking to them about the future, but you can't bear it now. And then he says this, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. And he, he calls him the spirit of truth. And then he said his job is to guide you into truth. Man, I just spent some time thinking about this verse this week. Because there's so many situations where I'm like, what is the truth? 
You know what? It turns out maybe CNN or Fox News or I don't whether you want to go one wing or the other wing, that might not be the arbitrator of truth. I mean, we live in a world where, you know, it used to be, well, if I saw it, I can believe it. Now you can see it, and it's not even true, right? So how in the world do you know? Because God has sent his Holy Spirit of truth, and he will guide us into truth. And we're wandering around looking for truth in a bunch of places other than God's word directed by God's Holy Spirit. You might be like, preacher, you're fired up. Listen, I'm not going to preach for two weeks. And I was thinking about, I was kind of going through my message yesterday. And I thought, gee, I could really get after it. And then I thought, well, well, I'll just make people mad. They'll forget about it by the time I get back. I'm going on vacation. It's true. You should come next week, though. We're going to have a great speaker. It's going to be a fantastic service. That's my promo. I'm going to watch it online. But I'm going to be out of the country. So if you're in the country, you should be here. But we're looking for truth. And God said, I've sent my Holy Spirit, and he will guide you into truth. The scripture is our standard. The Holy Spirit is our guide. And then we need to understand that some things are hard. Oftentimes, doing the right thing is hard. We live in a world where we want things to be easy. I want things to be easy in my life. I'm just telling you. I don't don't particularly enjoy any kind of pain, discomfort, physical, emotional, mental. I just want everything to be smooth sailing. And when it's not, I tend to avoid that. But sometimes doing the right thing can be difficult. First Samuel chapter 1, we read down through verse 20, but in verse 21 it says this. The next year, Elkanah and his family went on their annual trip to offer a sacrifice to the Lord and to keep his vow. But Hannah didn't go. She told her husband, wait until the boy is weaned, then I will take him to the tabernacle and leave him there with the Lord permanently. Now, not an unreasonable thing, right? I mean, it's just a year later, she has conceived and been pregnant and delivered a son. He can't be that old at this point. Just a few months, right? And she said, I'm not making the trip this year. Elkanah said, verse 23, whatever you think is best, he's grown, amen? I was like, oh, Elkanah's getting it. And then he says this, stay here for now and may the Lord help you keep your promise. So she stayed home and nursed the boy until he was weaned. When the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh. They brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice. And it goes through and talks about the sacrifice and that she left her son. And in 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, Then Elkanah returned home to Ramah without Samuel. And the boy served the Lord by assisting Eli the priest. I can imagine Hannah rocking that baby boy in her arms and thinking, God, why did you give me this child and now I've got to give him away? We're told that Hannah would see Samuel every year on their trip. She would bring him a new coat and she would be able to interact with him then, but she would only see him once a year as he grew. But she had made a vow to God, and God had given her a son to be used by him. And Samuel was used mightily by God. It was Samuel who anointed Saul to be king, the first king of Israel. It was Samuel who corrected Saul and and then would anoint David 
to be king over Israel. God, Samuel for an entire generation, really almost two, was the mouthpiece of God to the nation of Israel. And God began from an early age to speak to Samuel and to speak through Samuel. But first, Hannah had to give Samuel to God. She had to do what was difficult to do. Which brings us to our second point this morning. Raising children, following God, Living our lives in a way that is pleasing to him requires faith. Hebrews 11 and verse 1 says this, faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. That's faith. I was thinking about that, how that sometimes there will be things come along that are sort of evidentiary to what we would believe. Like you'll see a study and it'll say, you know, people who pray experience more joy in their life or uh, are more content or, or whatever. And you go, oh, well, there's evidence that prayer is good. But what if a study came out and said, people who pray are more depressed? Should that mean we shouldn't pray? Like, I've seen studies that say, you know, people who enjoy sex in the confines of marriage between a man and a woman have more frequent and more satisfying sex. But what if a study said the exact opposite? Because faith is the evidence of things you can't see. To walk by faith, to live by faith, means at times we're going to do things and we don't see how they're going to work out. We do not understand what God is doing, but we have to believe him anyway. That's what faith is. It's what we can't see. If we could see it, it wouldn't be faith. And so when we talk about Scripture being our foundation, the spirit being our guide, and doing difficult things, it's often because we have to, on faith, do what we don't fully understand or see how God's gonna use it. And yet we've gotta do it anyway because following Christ requires faith. Raising kids requires faith. Romans chapter 10 and verse 10 says this, for it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. You know Romans 10, right? Romans 10, 13, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's talking about salvation, how we come to Christ, our sins, the wrong things we've done are forgiven. We're given a relationship with God. We're given eternal life with God. But he says it begins here in Romans chapter 10 by believing in our heart, by having faith. And then he says we openly declare it because real faith leads to action. You can't, you can't believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ is going to forgive you of your sins and give you eternity in heaven and then never talk about it. That doesn't make sense. Listen, if I, if I have a great burger, I'm sharing it with folks. How much more the God of this universe is, has a relationship with me? It's a natural progression that we would openly declare what God has done. We need to pray in faith. Hannah was in deep anguish, 1 Samuel 1.10 crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. You ever pray and feel like God's not hearing you? I have. Pray and wonder if it does any good at all. Maybe you sit and you spend time in prayer and you walk away and you're like, I don't feel any better. You might even feel worse. 
but we've got to pray in faith. James says this in James chapter one, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But then he says this, but when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver. For a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not, to ex should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything they do. A prayer of faith is not, you don't know, you know, I don't know if God's going to work or not, but I'm just going to cover all my bases and pray, pray and see what God's going to do. That's not a prayer of faith. A prayer of faith is recognizing and understanding that we often face situations in which only God can help us. He's the only one. I mean, I've referenced it before, but I specifically remember, I remember it with all my children, the same feeling, but with my first child, our, our son, it was the most, the most significant. I remember coming home from the hospital, we're in our home, my wife is there, she's recovering physically, I'm there, I'm holding this kid, and I'm like, what, what, what is going on? What are we doing? How is this legal? Like, how could they send this kid home with me? Seriously, like, you have to take a course to be able to drive, but a kid, you're just there like, here. I'm like, I need a learner's permit. I need a tutor. I need help. Maybe, you're, maybe you grew up in a dysfunctional home. And you're a parent, and you're like, how am, I gonna, how am I gonna try to raise my child in a way that's not the way I was raised? Maybe it's not about children at all, but maybe you're facing a situation right now, and, and there's, you just don't see any hope. You don't see any, in any way out. Listen, we face those things all of the time where only God can help. But the thing is, he promises to help. He promised right here in James. He said, listen, if anyone lacks wisdom, that's funny, isn't it? It should just be like, look, all of you who lack wisdom, ask God, believe, and he will give it. God doesn't penalize us for not knowing the answer. That's what he says. God, God doesn't, when we go to God and say, God, I have no idea how to deal with this situation. I need your help. God doesn't go, well, come on. You ought to be smarter than that. No, God goes, you came to the right place. And he gives wisdom to us. We need to pray in faith. James goes on in James 5 and verse 16 and says this, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other so that you may be healed. And then he says this, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. That's what I want in my life. I want the power of God to be at work. And we've got to pray in faith. And then finally this morning, we've got to act in faith. We read Hebrews 11 and verse 1, this great faith chapter. It said that faith is the evidence of things not seen. And in verse 6, it says, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Faith always is accompanied by action, by some kind of an action. Now, maybe, maybe sometimes when we pray in faith, maybe the action is waiting. It's not in action, but it's, it's waiting on God. It's looking for God to work instead of running off and doing our own thing. But faith, real faith, is always going to be put into action. 
That's what James talks about in James chapter 2 and verse 14, where he says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing, and you say, goodbye and have a good day. Stay warm and eat well. Good luck. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself isn't enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. Real faith is going to be put into action. You can't just talk about it. You, you can't just, just come to church and say, well, I, I've got faith. It's true in our relationships. It's true in our families. I think one of the worst things we can do is say we have faith and then live lives before our children that show we don't. Because then what are they supposed to think about God and the faith that we supposedly have? I recognize, I told you before, I'm not a perfect parent. But I hope my children know that when I, tell, when I say I love Jesus Christ, I try to live a life in a way that reflects that. As imperfect as that is. I also let them know that that imperfection is not because of the God I serve, it's because of the servant. But our faith has to be put into action. I don't know what that means for you. Maybe that means that you've got to go to that person and begin to restore that relationship, even though you think they ought to come to you. Maybe that faith needs to be put into action. Maybe that means that you've got to start doing what God has called you to do, even if you don't understand why or how that's going to work out. Maybe that means implementing some biblical and godly principles in your, the way you're raising your children, even if other people don't think that that's what the experts might say. Kids are having fun somewhere. They're in a different room and there's vents that come up here. That's why we don't put them in that room. I'll just go over to the vent and yell down, hey, God says settle down. <laughs> See if they put their faith in action. I don't know what that means for you today, but I know that we can't just say we have faith. The world's not looking for people that say they've got something. The world's looking for people that have something. They're not looking for people that say they have faith. They're looking for people who are living out their faith. Our children are not gonna be spiritually influenced for the cause of Christ by, what, by just what we tell them, but they need to see it in our life. I'll close with this illustration. I didn't plan on doing this, but I thought about this this week. I've talked about this before. My father, uh, I was 18 years old when my father passed away. And when he died, I remember us going through his belongings. And I'm the oldest of three boys, so I was the first for a lot of things, you know? And my father had a, a temper. And, and at times, it was, it was rough. And you know how um, if, you're, if you're a parent and you have children, like there's that one kid. You know that one kid that just, maybe they're not worse than the others, but just the way they do it. I was that kid for my father. I know that. Like I know I just pushed his buttons. And so I saw that temper. 
And as my dad, my dad died when he was 39, so it's not like he got old. But the older he got, the less that temper was. Like it wasn't as bad for my younger brother, and it was, I mean, my baby brother, he was spoiled. <laughs> yeah. But when he died, I got this New Testament and Psalms and Proverbs that he would carry in his shirt pocket at work. And as I leafed through it, verses were underlined. And every verse that was underlined had to do with anger. Don't be angry. Don't, don't let your wrath control you. All these verses, especially in Proverbs. And I realized that it wasn't just a situation of my father kind of mellowed, but I realized that God was at work in his life. And I, that's the testimony that I want my children to see in me. They will not have to look very far to find flaws. It's, it seems like it's a game with them. They find them all the time. I don't know who's winning, but they're all ahead. But I want them to see that God is at work. That dad's not quite as angry or impatient or whatever. That, that God is at work and that, that the fruits of the Spirit are becoming more evident in my life and that, that, that they will not have to wonder if God is real. They will see it in me. That my faith will be in action. And that that faith they will take and God will sim similarly do a work in them. I want to conclude this morning just by reading for you out of 2 John chapter 1. This short little letter that John writes. He says this. This letter is from John the elder. I am writing to the chosen lady and to her children whom I love in the truth as does everyone else who knows the truth, because the truth lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace, which come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, will continue to be with us who live in truth and love. How happy I was to meet some of your children and find them living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded. God, I pray that that would be the testimony of my life, that people would meet my children and find them walking in truth. God, I pray that that would be the testimony of, of other families that are here today, that that would be the testimony of our church, that, that, that kids that are here would hear and see your truth. That they would recognize that your truth is found in your word, that they would understand that your truth is guided to us by the Holy Spirit. And God, that they would live out lives. Not just that we would be proud of, but God, that you would find pleasing. Help us to take the application of your word and apply it in our families, in our relationships, in our lives, in the weeks, in the months to come. In Christ Jesus' name we pray, amen.